we might take the expression barbarian invasions to mean some kind of blood and thunder influx. There will be drama, but the invasion was hardly new when it started with Hengist and Horsa in Kent. Angles and Saxons, Franks, Frisians, Jutes and others had been coming to the western provinces of the Roman Empire and some must have settled and been Romanized from at least the first century AD. Some came as imperial troops, many others must have come as traders, some of them settling, others returning, still others perhaps going back and forth. Some may have come as refugees, seeing the Roman Empire as a more comfortable option to remaining in the dank, uncivilized forests of Germany. This is how Roman writers saw that region just beyond imperial control across the River Rhine. But with the fall of the empire in the west, these incomers became more numerous, rather as some East Europeans have been arriving in the west since the fall of the most recent of the European empires, the Soviet Union, in 1989-91. By the middle of the 4th century, these races may have become more piratical, or appeared so to the imperial government in the new Roman capital of Constantinople. About that time, perhaps a bit before, a count of the Saxon shore was appointed to serve in the distant province of Britannia, possibly with some kind of coast guard functions at sea and on his landward side. With the withdrawal of regular Roman forces from about 381, Britain had to fend for itself and over the next hundred years, there was an influx from modern North Germany and elsewhere. It became an invasion, resulting sometimes in pitched battles between natives and incomers. We can imagine this from comparable, observable influxes of foreigners into places in more recent times, Spanish and Portuguese into South and Central America from the 16th century, and English and other races from the 17th century into what were to become the United States and Canada. If you are of my generation, you were probably taught early on at school that the Anglo-Saxons arrived in copious numbers, driving the native Britons northward into Scotland and Cumbria and westward into Wales, Cornwall and Devon. The Anglo-Saxons are thought to have been a mishmash of people from Denmark and North Germany, known then as Saxony. There were probably other adventurers from other parts of Germany or even farther afield who were led by Angle or Saxon warlords whose language and manners their followers spoke and shared or they adopted. Hengist and Horsa were two such leaders who gathered about themselves small bands of armed men and led them on adventures into Britain. Although their boats are called longships, the capacity of these vessels was small. By the time you had got on board weapons, armour, water, provisions, even horses, there may have been room for ten fighting men, pirates or soldiers as you like. If you were Franks, you just walked into the Roman province of Gaul from Germany, in very much larger numbers, we might safely assert, than Anglo-Saxons who were restricted by the capacity of their boats. The sea, named the English moat in Shakespeare's Henry V, was still very much in use as late as 1940-41, when Adolf Hitler abandoned Operation Sea Lion, the German invasion plan of Britain from the French Channel ports. According to the chronicler Nennius, probably a Welsh monk, Hengist and Horsa came with only three ships. The number of expeditions grew as word got back that the land was rich and the people no match in warfare. They may have found a more or less peaceful post-Roman partly Christianized people where the Roman villas survived in places. What had not survived since the Romans was a central authority capable of gathering taxes and arranging defense. 
No doubt the wealthy bought their own security on the withdrawal of Roman troops and Roman protection of property. These protectors, called feuderies, may have been Britons who had fought for Rome in Europe and who had found a ready market for their skills when they returned to Britain. The legend of King Arthur may have arisen from one such mercenary. The incomers were an organised war band. They would have established bridgeheads and deliberately caused local havoc to cow the indigenous population as they looked for food and booty. Where they might have faced stiff resistance, they probably took to their boats, as the Vikings were to do three centuries later, when the going got too tough. In a conquest, organisation, determination and fear of the indigenous population are everything. In the 5th century, some Britons, the wealthy ones, moved out of what was to become England. Hordes of coin and household items have been unearthed by archaeologists, which suggests that Britons fled, burying the valuables they could not carry, but perhaps expecting to return to retrieve them in better times. But most must have stayed put, and just as the Britons, 400 years before, had gradually adopted the language and social mores of their Roman conquerors, so they adopted the language and social mores of their latest conquerors, the Anglo-Saxons. There are today apparently no ethnic differences among the great swath of the English people, or Southern Scottish or Welsh, and it is likely that most of us are not pure Anglo-Saxons at all, but Britons with squirts of all sorts of other blood in our veins. This must have long been the case. The new warlords spoke a different language, and the Britons adopted it, because it made sense to be able to communicate with the new masters, as it had made sense to speak Latin under the Romans. It would make sense in the 7th and 8th centuries in the Near East for the conquered peoples there to speak Arabic under their new Muslim rulers, the Caliphs. Previously they had spoken Greek and Aramaic, the former now confined to the country of Greece, the latter a dead language. More recent comparisons might be found in South America, where Spanish and Portuguese are today spoken as the main languages, which is reflected in the alternative name for this continent, Latin America. Another example might be British India. There, three or four hundred million people were ruled in peacetime at the height of the Raj in the late 19th century by about a hundred thousand British. Hindi, Urdu and other local languages thrive, but English is widely understood in India and Pakistan, not just among the elite, and English remains one of the legal languages of the subcontinent. This is the more so in recent years because English is the language of business and commerce thanks to the economic superiority of America. In Britannia, the ruled adopted the language of the new rulers in what became known as Anglo-Saxon England. As we saw, the earliest recorded dispute between host and incomers in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle was the fallout of some sort between Vortigern and Hengist and Horsa. At the time of his history, in the early 8th century, St. Bede, as quoted in Annal 449 of the Chronicle, may well have got the identities of the invaders and their places of settlement about right. The Roman province of Britannia had been divided by Bede's time into shifting kingdoms or chieftainships, one of the first important of which was the Kingdom of Bernicia, lately to be absorbed and to become Northumbria, where Bede lived. We noted earlier that Bede distinguished three groups of incomers in his history, Saxons, Angles and Jutes, who came from Jutland, that spur of land that forms the Danish mainland today. The Saxons settled Wessex, Sussex, Essex, those places that end with S-E-X. The Angles settled East Anglia, the Midlands, which was called Mercia, Yorkshire and Northumbria, and the Jutes settled Kent, and the south coast as far as Southampton Water and the Isle of Wight. Franks and Gauls from France had also formed some settlements in the south, and some Irish had settled in modern Merseyside, a settlement that was to become their own a thousand years later, as landless Irish flooded into England to provide the muscle for the Industrial Revolution. By mid-8th century, England was divided into seven principal kingdoms known as the Heptarchy. British kingdoms survived in Dumnonia, roughly Devon and Cornwall, and in Wales. There had been British principalities in the West, particularly in Wales, since the early days of Roman rule, 
St Gildas, a Briton living in independent Wales in the 6th century, writes of an influx of Britons to Wales in his ruin of Britannia as Anglo-Saxons established themselves. But like most chroniclers, he was writing for his privileged audience and may well have been biased. Some Britons in the higher echelons of society, including St Gildas, certainly decamped to Brittany, hence that French province's name, Bretagne. But there is strong circumstantial evidence from the king lists of early Anglo-Saxon tribal leaders of their adopting British names. Caedwalla, 11th King of Wessex, being an illustration in the 7th century. Intermarriage at the highest levels of Anglo-British society implies intermarriage at all levels. There are reports in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle of bloody battles of these German settlers with the British and Welsh, but there is nothing in the Chronicle from which one could infer that the English prosecuted a policy of ethnic cleansing, or of the British Welsh being treated as second-class race by the incomers. Domination is often born of a sense of self-preservation. Angles, Saxons and Jutes intermarried with the Britons. Scots from Ireland intermarried with indigenous Picts and a royal marriage was to result in the Kingdom of Scotland. They must also have been intermarried long before under Roman rule. Romans themselves must have intermarried and there had been African and German emperors. It has probably been well said of the Anglo-Saxons by Charles Mosley in Blood Royal that there was no apartheid ban on cross-racial mating for them. Genocide does not appear to have been an Anglo-Saxon policy. It certainly became one in the colonization of the United States, where after independence in 1783, those Americans of British descent were preponderant and soon propounded the theology of manifest destiny whereby the new country should spread from sea to shining sea, from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. This enabled the new republic to justify the wholesale slaughter of the indigenous Americans, or their confinement to small reservations which duly took place. Back in Britain, at the end of the 7th century, like Bede, we may be able to start talking about the English, whose conversion to Catholic Christianity had begun a century before. As we've noticed, Christianity was not just important in the religious context at a period when religion was all, it was politically important. It was a binding agent, helping to smooth out the racial creases. And the interdependence of the Roman Church and the embryonic English states can be dated from this time, an interdependence that was to last until the reign of King Henry VIII, 900 years later. Another episode is suddenly over. Next time we shall be looking at a Roman emperor who declared Christianity the state religion of his empire, which included Britain. <laughs>